everlasting God, the radiance of faithful souls, who brought the nations to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Fill the world with your glory and show yourself to all the nations through him who is the true light and the bright morning star, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
God judges the nations with righteousness and answers the poor with justice. Trusting in God's mercy, let us now confess our sin. God of glory, you sent Jesus among us as the light of the world to reveal your love for all people. We confess that our sin and pride hide the brightness of your light. We turn away from the poor. We ignore cries for justice. We do not strive for peace. In your mercy, cleanse us of our sin and pour out the gifts of your spirit that, forgiven and renewed, we may show forth your glory shining in the face of Jesus Christ. Friends, the mercy of the Lord is like the rain, showers that water the earth. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. And friends, as God has forgiven us, so let us also forgive one another. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. And now, as we turn to the hearing of God's word, let us pray for the Holy Spirit to illumine our hearing. Holy One, giver of all light, lift up our hearts and minds to Christ, the morning star that never fades. By the light of your Holy Spirit, Reveal to us your saving word and lead us to offer our lives to you in service and in love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes, and look around. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. God of heaven and earth, whose voice in strident echoes resounds above the waters, and all the worlds 
sings glory, glory, glory. The desert rides in tempest. The wind whips trees to fury. The lightning splits the forest. And flame diffuses glory. A reading from the third chapter of the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I wrote above in a few words a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and had with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, and with you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. As you'll see, I recorded this week's sermon on Wednesday afternoon, just as we were beginning to get reports of trouble in Washington, D.C. Armed rioters stormed the Capitol building, overwhelming the police, entering the chamber, some of them wearing white supremacist paraphernalia and carrying the Confederate flag. They disrupted the certification of a duly conducted democratic election, and legislators and staff were forced to take cover, some of them trapped in the dangerous air of the pandemic. We watched on TV, riveted, feeling angry, betrayed, sorrowful, frightened, utterly shocked. And yet also, horribly, this was well within the realm of what we've come to expect as possible these last four years. Wednesday was also, ironically enough, the Feast of the Epiphany, when we commemorate the star that rose and guided the wise men from the East to go to Jerusalem to see the baby Jesus, born King of the Jews. And yet, in our own world, it seemed very much on that day that King Herod reigned ascendant. In the days that followed, I wondered what to do with this sermon I'd preached. It felt like a particularly joyful one. In it, I tell the story of my own journey of faith, which is not so much a story about believing as it is about beholding and belonging, beholding the story of God in Scripture and coming to belong to the community of believers that is the Church. I connected the theme to baptism of the Lord, which we also celebrate this Sunday. And I ended the sermon with yet another joy, the joy of welcoming a new member to our congregation here at First Presbyterian Tallahassee. I was pleased with it in the end. But then I asked myself, given what's going on in the world, is this really the right sermon for today? Can we really celebrate revelation and belonging when the world as we know it seems to be falling apart? So I looked at our texts again, at the story of the Magi as told by Matthew, and the baptism of the Lord as told in Mark, and I realized something. For all of the brightness, for all of the joy in both of these texts, they are also full of danger. They take place precisely at a moment when the world is falling apart. In Matthew, the Magi, ignorant of the political turmoil in Jerusalem, bungle into the city, openly asking after the new baby who's been born king of the Jews. Herod, who thinks of himself as king, gets wind of this and enlists them in his own agenda, seeking them out so that they'll find the child for him for his own political purposes. But Revelation intervenes again, and a dream warns the Magi not to return to him. Herod, furious, orders an infanticide, killing all the babies in Jerusalem. And Jesus, Mary, and Joseph are forced to flee. The true king begins his life as a refugee, while the false one rails and rages on the throne. This is the context of Epiphany. And then we have Mark's Gospel, 
the adult Jesus baptized in the Jordan. Also, on its face, a moment of revelation, a joyful celebration of God's glory revealed in Christ, the Spirit descending like a dove, the voice from heaven, You are my beloved Son. But behold, the context here is also danger from the state. Forty days after Jesus' baptism, John the Baptist is arrested. Within a year, both he and Jesus will be dead, murdered at the hands of the state. John's head brought to Herod on a platter. Jesus hung from a Roman cross to die. And the context in which Mark writes his gospel is also one of danger. He wrote in the midst of war, when the Roman Empire came down hard on Judea, sieging Jerusalem, storming the temple, burning the sacred building to the ground. There's trouble lurking in these texts, worldly trouble, political trouble. And it's precisely in this context the light arrives, that Christ appears, bringing his message of good news of a very different kind of kingdom. Of course, not all those who claim this story understand their faith this way. Some of the rioters in the capital carried not just Confederate flags, but also crosses, signs reading Jesus 2020, proclaiming a violent, militant version of the faith. A number of you noted this when we gathered on Wednesday night on Zoom for prayer. And afterwards, one of you asked a really good and thoughtful question. You said, what's our responsibility as Christians to address this distortion of the message? How do we change hearts and minds? How do we talk to the people we know who understand and express their faith in a violent, nationalistic way? I think this is vital, important work, something all of us can do. And I think the first step is something that some of us often find pretty uncomfortable, witnessing. That is learning to speak of our faith, learning to express in the language of religion our beliefs about God and Christ. Jesus said, let your light shine before others in order to be seen by them. And that is part of our calling as Christians, to hold up our light in the midst of this world, to proclaim a message of love and truth especially in the midst of this darkness. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. What the light in today's scriptures illumines is a very different kind of king, one who comes not to destroy, but to save, not to seize power, but to empower others, not to oppress, but to love and honor and heal. The light calls us to behold this king in all his glory, even in the midst of all this earthly chaos. And it calls us to belong to the community of his followers, baptized in his broken, resurrected body, joined to those who seek another way, the way of justice, love, and peace. The darkness in these texts is very real, but so is the light. The darkness in our world is very real, but so is the light. And so I'll share with you my sermon after all, full as it is of the, the splendor of light and of the joy of belonging. And I do so because I still believe that that light is very real. Friends, I am aware once again today of the limitations of pre-recording worship. We're recording this sermon on Wednesday afternoon in the midst of a series of troubling headlines coming out of Washington regarding the storming of the Capitol on the day of the certification of the election results. I don't know how this story will unfold, and so I don't know the state of play on Sunday morning. I'm going to preach the sermon that I've prepared for today and hope that it will contain some good news. At the very end of 2020, Something happened that we could all be excited about. The star of Bethlehem appeared. It wasn't really a star at all, it was two planets that aligned in the night sky, Jupiter and Saturn. But it was a rare occurrence, 
The last time it happened was 800 years ago. And it was something everybody could get unambiguously excited about, something not related to pandemic or to politics, a little piece of good news at the end of a very bad year. I heard about it from all quarters, from Christian friends, from science geeks, from astrology buffs, from Wiccans, even from the Holderness family, who produce silly pop song parodies that go viral on the internet. Even they were getting excited about it. And so on Monday night, December 21st, the longest, darkest night of the year, I tromped up to the rooftop of the, West, of the Westminster Oaks parking garage and joined a small crowd that was gathered to look up at the night sky, to gaze at the sight that's said to have guided the Magi to the Christ child 2,000 years ago. Today we celebrate two special days in the church calendar, Epiphany, which falls on January 6th, and Baptism of the Lord, the Sunday immediately after that. It's as though these two liturgical planets have aligned this morning. Epiphany commemorates the revelation to the Magi, the star rising in the east to signal that a child had been born king of the Jews. And Baptism of the Lord commemorates the moment when John baptized Jesus in the waters of the, of the river Jordan, and the skies opened, and the Spirit descended like a dove, and a voice from the heavens cried, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Both of these are moments of revelation, when a signal from above, a star, a voice, illuminates something earthly. A child born in Bethlehem, a man emerging from the Jordan. There are moments when something within, the identity of Christ, is revealed from somewhere beyond. Sing of God made manifest, we sang, naming the places in the story of Scripture where the miraculous character of God in Christ is made known. Today I'm going to share with you a bit of my own story. I do this with some chagrin. It feels a little presumptuous because our stories from Scripture are about God's revelation in Christ, and here I am revealing to you something about myself. I'm doing this in part as a way for you to get to know me a little bit in advance of my installation later on this month, but also because our theme for the day is revelation. And what I hope to share with you is not so much a story about me but a story about how Christ was revealed to me, how God was made manifest to me through my life and experience. I may be repeating myself for some of you, and I apologize for that. But I'm doing this because I hope that as we get to know each other better, you'll share some of your faith stories with me, too. I didn't grow up in the faith. Like the Magi, I came from the East, my childhood in a secular family in southern New England, my young adult years in the liberal academic bubble that is the Ivy League. I was a bright kid, but a skeptic. I thought that religion was little more than a pacifier for people who didn't like to think for themselves. I was newly out and dismissed as hostile, a church that I hadn't really gotten to know. The light, that arose and shone in my life was not a star, but a set of windows. I know I've told you this part. The 13th century stained glass of Gothic cathedrals in France, luminous mosaics glowing red and blue that captivated my attention the summer before my senior year of college. I'd gone, there to, I'd gone to Paris on a research grant to study the decriminalization of homosexuality during the French Revolution. But every chance I got, I emerged from the basement of the Bibliothèque Nationale and made my way to a different church to see the windows and the stories that they contained. The characters of the Bible could be identified by their attributes, Moses with his horns, Peter with a set of keys, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle, the 12 minor prophets on display on one side of the sanctuary and the 12 apostles on the other. I hadn't grown up with scripture in my life, but through the windows, I got to know the stories. At the end of the summer, I returned home enchanted, my mind awash in bright color, my imagination peopled with ancient characters. Back in New Haven, 
There wasn't much stained glass, but there were Bibles in English. And so to stay immersed in the world of these characters, I started reading scripture for myself. This, too, was a revelation. I'd expected the Bible to be dull, pious, and moralizing, but it was lively, difficult, and strange, full of fully human humans and an often inscrutable God. Now, in all of this investigation, I had no idea what I believed. I wish I could tell you I followed the example of the Magi right then and made a beeline for Jesus in order to see him for myself. But that's not what I did. It felt unusual and uncomfortable and, to be honest, a little embarrassing in my secular New England context to admit that I was curious about God. So I decided to be curious about religion instead. I could avoid the question of what I believed by finding out what everybody else did. I started visiting churches to see what they were like. I went not to worship, but to observe. What was the relationship between the words of scripture and the way that people practiced their faith? I became fascinated by American denominational variety. Why, if everyone had the same Bible, did American churches look so different? How could one single genotype, as it were, produce such a wide array of characteristics? The thought of a career in ministry did cross my mind at the time, but it felt absurd. There were no churchgoers in my family, not to mention ministers, and I had no denomination, and I still had no idea what I believed. So I worked for a year following college, and then enrolled at Harvard Divinity School, figuring I was obsessed enough that I should become a religious studies professor. But when I tried to make a career in academia, my interest seemed to shrivel up and die. I discovered through some rather painful failure that I'm not much of a specialist. The prospect of producing scholarly monographs felt daunting and uninteresting to me. But there was something for, more fundamental than that going on. I wasn't ready to admit it to myself yet, but I wasn't interested in treating the scripture that I had come to love as an artifact of other people's past beliefs. Instead, I wanted to believe that it was a living, breathing text with something to say to me now. Embarrassed, I put the whole thing aside. I stopped reading the Bible, visiting churches, seeking out religious art. I worked for a few years and then made what I thought was the respectable decision of applying to law school. I had good grades and I test well and I was admitted to Yale. But as I prepared to begin my studies there, those old familiar stories of scripture came back to call to me again in a way that the law did not. Again, I felt as though I was heading down a path that wouldn't give me life. Now I wanna pause here because I've told you about setting aside careers in academia and law, and if I come across as insulting professors and lawyers, I realize I've probably insulted two-thirds of this congregation. So I want to be clear. Both of those fields are good and noble callings, where faithful Christians can live out their vocations of study and service. It's just that my intellect and temperament were built for something else, and I finally realized, as a 1L, that it was time to listen. Ironically, I still had no idea what I myself believed. But when a law school classmate invited me to go along with her church shopping, I agreed to come. We tried a number of local churches before landing at First Presbyterian Church of New Haven, which happened to be the most robust congregation in town. It was a congregation that was, like you, full of lawyers and professors. And they, like like you, enjoyed good music and good liturgy and good preaching. And like you, they brought not just their minds to their faith, but their bodies and their hearts as well. They didn't have stained glass windows. Instead, bright, clear panes of glass, like ours, that opened out onto the city. They took the gospel seriously in worship and in mission, and they enjoyed each other's company. I found a home there. and they baptized me. I didn't have much notice. I'd been attending for an entire semester, and I'd gone to the lunch for prospective new members, 
When it came time to baptism, they just said one Sunday, how about next Sunday? And to be honest, in my case, that was probably for the best because I didn't have too much time to get in my own head about it, about whether I yet believed the right things in order to belong. It was pouring down rain on the day of my baptism. I didn't have a car at the time, and so I had to walk to church in my old foul weather gear left over from my high school days in the Sea Scouts, which I took off and curled up into a ball in a plastic bag and shoved in a corner before meeting with the session. They didn't ask what I believed. Instead, they asked if I trusted in God's mercy and if I would seek to follow Jesus. And I found that I could say yes. And so, in worship, they baptized me. The church was an A-frame building, all roof. And that day, the rain was leaking terribly. Buckets everywhere to catch the rain. The water falling on everyone's head. The whole congregation was getting wet that day. But it was as though we were all being baptized together. Maria one of the co-pastors doused me three times with generous handfuls of water from the font, mixed, of course, with drops of rainwater. And as that water ran down my face and hair and shoulders, I opened my eyes and realized in that moment something about baptism, that baptism means belonging. In Christ's baptism, a voice from heaven claims Christ as God's own. And in our baptism, the Spirit claims that we belong to Christ and through Christ to each other, to his body. It didn't matter anymore that I was an outsider, not raised in the faith. It didn't matter that I was gay or that I'd made mistakes in choosing my, my profession or that I still couldn't say exactly what I believed. I was no longer a lone individual. Now I was part of a family of faith, a group of people looking together at the night sky. And for the rest of my life, the story that I'd come to love in scripture would now be a family story for me, our story, encountered in the company of others, a story that tells us something we believe about who God is and about who we are called to be. Barbara Brown Taylor, in her book, Leaving Church, talks about her realization that for her, the parts of faith that were about believing seemed to matter less than the parts of faith that were about beholding. Not what are you certain of, but what have you seen? Not what have you reasoned out, but what has been revealed? She points out that the Bible is full of beholds. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Behold, I send a messenger to prepare the way. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that is what Epiphany is about, beholding seeing God made manifest, and wondering, pondering what this might mean. And I would like to add today, on this day that is both Epiphany and Baptism of the Lord, that faith is not just about beholding, but also about belonging. We behold God made manifest, not by ourselves, but in the company of others, those who belong to Christ in baptism, our brothers and sisters in the faith. We have the joy today of welcoming a new member into the fellowship of this congregation, Bill Lampkin, who comes to us by letter of transfer from Faith Presbyterian Church. Bill may not be known to all of us yet, but he's been known to God his whole life long. We welcome him not as a stranger, but as a friend in Christ and as a brother in the faith. We'll do this by the font, to emphasize our ties in baptism, and we'll recite the Apostles' Creed together. 
You'll notice that we'll say three times those difficult words, I believe, I believe in God the Father, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, I believe in the Holy Ghost. But when we say those words, I believe, we don't say them alone. We say them all together, giving voice as a community of belonging to the sacred story we behold. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On behalf of the session, I present Bill Lampkin, who has been received into the membership of this congregation by transfer from Faith Presbyterian Church. Bill, in baptism you were claimed by God and marked as Christ's own forever and joined to, the body, to Christ's body by the Holy Spirit. You come to us then not as a stranger, but as a friend in Christ and as a member of the household of God. We rejoice that you now desire to join with this congregation in the worship and mission of the church. Hear these words from scripture. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One, one Lord, Lord, one, one faith, faith, one, one baptism, baptism, one God and Father, Father for all, who is, who is above, above all and through all, all and in all. And now, friends, as members of the body of Christ, let us reaffirm the faith in which we are baptized. I believe, I believe in, in God, God the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in, and in Jesus Christ, Christ his only Son, Son our Lord, who was conceived, conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, crucified dead, dead, and buried. He descended, he descended into hell. The third, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended, he ascended into, into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence, thence he shall come to judge the quick, the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Bill, we have professed our faith as one body. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, sharing its worship and mission through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? I will with God's help. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for calling us to be your people and joining us to Christ's body, the church. We praise you for leading Bill to this congregation. Empower us by your spirit, that we might love one another as Christ loved us, honoring him in all that we say and do, giving our lives in service to others. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Bill, welcome to this ministry that we share in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Good morning, First Presbyterian Church family. Just a reminder that this afternoon at one o'clock, the session will meet on Zoom. The Zoom link and the agenda have been emailed to all of our currently sitting elders. So look for that in your email box. Uh, youth group is on Zoom also tonight. So that starts at five o'clock and your uh, Zoom link has been sent to your email as well. Tomorrow, which is Monday, January 11th, the Healing Racism Task Force will meet from 6.30 to 7.30. So I have sent you a Zoom link, but if you want to participate in that group and haven't gotten the Zoom link, please email me at christy at oldfirstchurch.org. Thanks. So book group. 
keep on reading, leave the world behind. We are meeting on uh, the 21st of this month at seven o'clock for an interesting discussion of this book. So I'm looking forward to it. And if you haven't gotten the book, um, you still have time to start to read and get up to speed with us. So we look forward to seeing lots of you there. Have a great day. Please join me in praying for our people. Let us offer prayers for healing for Tara Reynolds, Jan O'Neill, Charles Freeman, Dan Hughes, Rita, mother of Anne Del Rossi, Sabrina Wright, Kate Kerr, Michelle, daughter of Rich Payton, all who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Let us offer prayers for strength and mercy for Frank and Jody Dorsey. Frank's mother, Frankie Dorsey, died on New Year's Day in Franklin, Tennessee. And for Jim and Wendy Davis, Jim's brother, Rick, died on January 5th. For Monique Van Pelt, and the staff and volunteers of Second Harvest of the Big Bend, health care providers, and first responders, Patricia McCoy DeLancey, Thaddeus Gillen, Sarah Lamar, Myrna McGowan, Barbara Jackson, Wilton Kane, and Skip West. We pray for Pastor Isette Sama Hernandez and the Presbyterian Church in Cuba, the churches of the Presbytery of Florida. Let us also pray for those in military service, including Zach McGuff, Jonathan Babineau, great nephew of Beth Pullum, Brian Guiseo, and Ross Yielding, nephew of Ed and Mary Cutter. Amen. Let us pray. God of glory, we seek your glory, the richness that transforms our drabness into color and brightens our dullness with vibrant light, your wonder and joy at the heart of all life. God of incense, we offer you our prayer, our spoken and unspeakable longings, our questioning of truth, our search for your mystery deep within. God of myrrh, we cry out to you in our suffering, the pain of all our rejections and bereavements, our baffled despair at undeserved suffering, our rage at continuing injustice, our fear at violence. And we embrace you God with us, in all our abundance, in our yearning, in our anger, and in our loss. Mindful of the many needs around us, we turn to you for faith and healing. We pray for the church, our community of belonging. Remember the people you have claimed in baptism by water and the Holy Spirit. Make us a sign of your life-giving grace. We pray for the world, Rule with compassion over chaos, especially in our own nation. Strengthen leaders to do what is right and bless all people with peace. We pray for this community. Send your Holy Spirit among us to speak truth in troubled times and break through the walls that divide us. We pray for loved ones. Speak your saving, healing word, bringing light into our darkness and comfort to all those who suffer. Gracious God, turn our mourning into dancing and change our sorrow into joy, so that we may give you thanks and praise forever. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Amen. Friends, the Magi brought gifts to offer Christ at his birth. And in baptism, God claims our lives as God's own. 
And so now, with, thank, with thankful hearts, let us offer our gifts and ourselves to God. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of majesty and light, you hold the world in your hand. We praise you that in Jesus Christ all people may see your glory. We thank you for revealing Jesus to be your Son and for claiming our lives in baptism to be his glad disciples. By your Spirit, May peace descend upon us, that we may follow him with grateful hearts. Take us and all we have to be useful in your service, God of all nations. In the gracious name of Jesus Christ, your Son, by the power of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now let us lift our voices in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, may the love of God, the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.